What does it mean to be a human being created in the image of God? In the brave new world of today, that's a loaded question. Modern culture in the West has affirmed a radical reinvention of the self that was barely imaginable when J. Gresson Machen wrote Christianity and Liberalism in 1923. Not only is LGBTQ ideology inescapable in schools, books, movies, fashion, sports, even beer and car commercials, it has become a dogma of the mainstream. And yet, as radical as this seems, there are prescient notes throughout Machen's 100-year-old book, words from his time that can help us make sense of our own, principles that help us to take every thought captive, even in a world that insists on allegiance to being everything we want to be, whenever we want it, on demand. Politics, technology, identity, power, science. Everything seems to be changing. So why not faith? This is Christianity and Liberalism, a podcast based on the book by J. Gresson Machen. In this show, we'll be discussing a modern day church in crisis and engaging with Machen's classic text to see what lessons we can learn and apply 100 years later. The line is drawn in the sand, Christ is gone and he's man Upon the rock of the word of God we will stand We bring the antithesis, the lamb's dripping wrist Is still the only answer for man's wickedness The line is drawn in the sand, Christ is gone and he's man Upon the rock of the word of God we will stand CNL, with Machen we will tell Faith in Christ still the only way to be redeemed from hell In 1923, the question of who we were as people looked and sounded a lot different than where we are today. But then, as now, men and women were reconsidering what God's Word said about them. And that's Machen's main concern in his chapter on God and man, that we understand what God has to say before we draw our own conclusions. On today's episode, I'll be speaking with Rosaria Butterfield. Rosaria is a former professor of English at Syracuse University and a best-selling author whose story of redemption from a life of sexual sin has reached thousands. In her first book, Secret Thoughts of an Unlikely Convert, Rosaria told the story of her life as a lesbian activist and what happened when she met Jesus. In the years since her conversion, Rosaria has raised a family and spoken to thousands about the promise of finding identity in Christ instead of ourselves. Like Machen's Christianity and Liberalism, her newest book, Five Lies of Our Anti-Christian Age takes a critical look at progressive ideology in the church today. We began our conversation about God and man with a quote from Machen's book. In chapter three of Christianity and Liberalism, his chapter titled God and Man, Machen tells us that, quote, the doctrine of God and the doctrine of man are the two great presuppositions of the gospel. With regard to these presuppositions, as with regard to the gospel itself, modern liberalism is diametrically opposed to Christianity. Mm -hmm. End quote. Yep. If we take it for granted that this was true in Machen's day, do you believe it's true in 2023 as well? And if so, yeah. how do you see modern liberalism diametrically opposed to a biblical doctrine of man today? Yeah, absolutely. I would say, um, uh, you know, to, to quote, um, uh, to quote Jane Austen, you know, my, my sore throats hurt more than everybody else's. So it's actually worse today than it was for Machen, even though, um, uh, you know, how do I know that? Right. Um, you know, what's so fascinating about this chapter that, that we're going to talk about today is it, it reminds me so much of the way that the, Heidelberg Catechism is laid out in the very beginning. You know, just the presuppositions that you need to know before you can, you know, really launch into this, this, these deep questions of, of personhood and faith. But what I would say is that this is most markedly evident in the invention of LGB, LGBTQ plus personhood ideas. 
you know, and it and it used to be five years ago, you would hear it more like, um, I'm struggling or um, I'm a woman born on a man's body or, but now it's very clear. This is who I am. We've, we've moved completely into a full embrace of ontological madness. And the way we got here is to not understand who God is and to not understand who man is. And another way to think about that, I mean, we could situate it in the in the in the in in the in the confessions and the creeds, but I think we could also situate this in Romans one, um, and specifically when you look at Romans one, you see a series of three exchanges. Um, so so you know, Romans one really offers us offers us just a fascinating way of entering into this. So let's start with, um, even with 21, 121, for all they, although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened, claiming to be wise. They became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged, exchange number two, the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And for this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions for their women exchanged, third exchange, natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And so um, we are, you know, these three exchanges have always been richly necessary to think about the exchange of truth for lies, the exchange of the worship of the creator for the worship of the creature, and then the exchange of a natural life-giving sexuality, heterosexuality for homosexuality, always been crucial. But right now, I think we're looking at a time where those exchanges are codified in the law of the land. And so Machen is hugely important for our day. Um, And, you know, they were codified in a couple of ways. I mean, you've got the Obergefell decision in 2015. It legalized gay marriage in all states, but what it really did, I'd say it's real crisis for um, for the church, is that it introduced a new category of personhood. It suggested that you are um, um, you are abusing or you are harming someone by failing to honor their dignity. It's called the dignitary harm clause. And how do you dishonor my dignity? by failing to use my pronouns, by failing to call me gay, by failing to put a pride sticker up on your Facebook page. And, you know, so when I was a lesbian, you, you would be, you know, harming me if I went in and bought a pizza, pe- trying to buy a pizza. And you said, I'm not selling pizzas to lesbians. And I'd say, but I want my pizza. And then, you know, if you didn't give me a pizza, I was harmed. But now it's all very, you know, it's all in this nebulous area. But then you also have the Bostock decision in 2020 that um, codified uh, LGBTQ plus as civil rights. And so at this particular moment, I would say Machen is, he, yeah, you know, he's the superpower of the confessional church. It's not hard to see that identity politics has entered the arena of civil rights. So I asked Rosera if she felt like sexual identity was the defining theological anthropological issue of our day. How she answered surprised me. So I, I imagine that you would say, you would give a hearty amen to this question, but is sexual identity the defining theological, anthropological issue of our day? And I'm assuming that you say yes. So what's well, at stake though? I would phrase it a little differently. I, okay. I would say that the gospel is on a collision course with it. Hmm. So that's what I would say. Recently, at the very ill-timed and ill-named National Transgender Day of Visibility, which is a national holiday, the 31st of March, 
Mm-hmm. It happened a couple of days after the Nashville shooting where a supposed transgender shooter opened fired at Covenant, um, mm-hmm. uh, slaughtering three nine-year-olds and, and three, um, uh, three adults who were there. Um, but this is what Biden said, quote, On the Transgender Day of Visibility, we want you to know that we see you just as you are, made in the image of God and deserving of dignity, respect, and support. Now, what that does, aside from not anybody wanting Joe Biden to be your 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 pastor, but what that does is it 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 um it very deceptively confuses what it means to be made in the image of God with being made as the image of God. And um, uh, so we're just seeing, we're on a collision course. And in fact, I'd say the collision happened. And at this point, because the collision has happened, um, the church really needs to wake up. And Machen is just that shot of lemon juice in the eyeball that we need. So, if our culture has got it so badly wrong, what does Christianity have to offer? Is the old, traditional understanding of human identity and relationships good enough for 2023? Where can we look for good news today? Here's a clip from the audiobook. How then shall God be known? How shall we become so acquainted with Him that personal fellowship may become possible? Some liberal preachers would say that we become acquainted with God only through Jesus. That assertion has an appearance of loyalty to our Lord, but in reality, it is highly derogatory of Him. For Jesus Himself plainly recognized the validity of other ways of knowing God, and to reject those other ways is to reject the things that lay at the very center of Jesus' life. You know, Machen does talk about some liberal preachers who would say that that we become acquainted with God only through Jesus. That assertion has an appearance of loyalty to our Lord, but in reality, it is highly derogatory of him. Mm-hmm. For Jesus himself, as he mentions, plainly recognized the validity of other ways of knowing God, and to reject these other ways is to reject the things that lay at the very center of Jesus' life. Mm-hmm. Jesus mm-hmm. plainly found God's hand in nature. The lilies mm-hmm. of the field revealed to him the artistry of God. He found God also in the moral law. The law written in the hearts of men was God's law, which revealed his righteousness. And Jesus plainly found God revealed primarily in the scriptures. Mm-hmm. For those who are on the fence about Christianity and liberalism itself, how do we see God's plan for a traditional understanding of gender, sex, and attraction in nature, and as we've seen in Romans 1 in Scripture. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and I would say the seeds of the gospel are in the garden. Hmm. So you, you, you cannot extract the, the message of the Lord Jesus Christ being, uh, uh, you know, s- suffering to preach and to teach and mm-hmm. to... And to to suffer the, the 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 temptations and the limitations that this mm-hmm. human body provides, and then to willingly go to the cross to uh, die for us, to die for the sins of His people, for those who will repent and to believe, and then to be uh, to descend, and then to be resurrected. And that is true whether we believe it or not. Mm-hmm. So that truth stands apart. From my feelings and you know my tummy aches and my sensibilities and and all of that and um, um, but the most I think the most convincing part of all of this is to just and I I mean I just remember very personally having to having to accept this that the word of God knows me better than I do hmm. and I remember really struggling when I first. Uh, you know, when I first came to Christ, I came to Christ because Jesus is who he says he is. And I believed that that was objectively true, whether I believed it or not. But at that point, I hadn't stopped feeling like a lesbian um, because those feelings, um, you know, sexual sin runs deep and hard and strong. And I had to accept the truth of really the the Westminster Confession of Faith as found, um, you know, outlined in the scriptures that 
Jesus is the word made flesh. He is inseparable from the word. And the word knows me better than I know myself. And, 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 you know, and then I had to sit there in what felt like an abyss for a while Mm. in that, in that reality. But how grateful I am that at the time that that was happening to me, I didn't have some, you know, I didn't have any kind of influence of side B gay Christianity or Wes Hill or Greg Johnson or Revoice. You know, nobody said, Hey, Rosaria, we're so glad to have you. Maybe we should get a gay bowling league so you won't feel too alone. You know, no, what, you know, what they said was repent and believe, grow in Christ. And then you don't have to be gay. You know, and, and this is this idea that somehow gay is who I am ontologically is, um, I think is something that the word of God really destroys with its sword in a powerful and helpful way, especially for those of us like me who found herself in that, you know, in that, in that predicament of the flesh. Hmm. Homosexuality comes from the world, the flesh and the devil. It doesn't come from image bearing. And the Lord Jesus Christ, when he uh, died on the cross, his blood does not make an ally with the sin it crushes on the cross. It can't. So I can't identify with my sin and claim it as ontologically true and claim that I have Christ's resurrection power. I can't do it. And that's part of why all of our, and what I love about Machen, because I think, again, I, you know, Machen is my superpower, right? I mean, you know, he's he's the reason I can say things like, oh, you're a false teacher, um, you know, Mr. Johnson. Oh, you know, you're a false teacher, Mr. Sprinkle. Um, you know, because all I, I'm not reading your heart. I'm reading your books. It's that simple. Um, and I don't have to, sp- you know, shed a tear over that. Uh, I pray that you'll repent and turn around because, the teaching of a falsehood is maybe, you know, more dangerous than even the believing of it, right? I mean, it's it's uh, Thomas Watson who says that loving a sin is actually worse than committing it. And of course, he's not making a false ranking like, oh, commit all the sins you want, just don't love it. It's just that whatever you love, the sin that you love, you're going to commit eventually anyway. Mm-hmm. And usually you're making some converts to your to your sin pattern in the process. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I I would say that it is just a, a, a hugely important reality. And, and every heretic um, would, I mean, every Christian heretic, that is, would be happy to tell you that Jesus is saying to do this, but, but the word is saying to do that. And so, um, and that is, that is, uh, um, I think that that is a really sad predicament uh, I, I don't think you can be saved by your theology or saved by the blood of Christ, but I think you can be condemned by your theology. And I've known a lot of people, a lot of people who were side B gay Christianity. That's the celibate gay Christian movement who are now side A because side B is just the waiting room for side A. Yeah. And there's a kind of fervor. I mean, I don't know if you, these are competing religions. These are not, it's not like you have the Christian religion and then you have this kind of secular gay, you know, gay world. I mean, we long for the day when atheists knew they were atheists, don't we? That'd make it easier. But, you know, this, this idea that, um, that God loves you just as you are, regardless of what the scripture says, because your personal experience can be elevated over scripture has led to all kinds of insane things. I mean, at the end of God and the gay Christian, Matthew Vine says this, um, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people have an estimable dignity and worth. So how could the suffering that they endure when they are not affirmed by their families and churches express God's intentions toward his creation. For us to affirm same-sex relationships would not change the Bible's core truths about sin, repentance, and redemption. How did he get there? He get there. He got there by saying personal experience is what's true. The word is messed up. Mm-hmm. In fact, given that same-sex orientation is consistent with God's image, affirming those relationships is the only way to defend those truths with clarity, coherence and persuasiveness. So he's saying it's the only way. 
And to quote a friend, an old friend of mine, she used to be a research assistant of mine decades ago. She came to me and she said, Rosaria, you need to repent of your repentance because I'm concerned you're going to go to hell. Because by repenting of what you call the sin of lesbianism, you have put heavy burdens on the backs of gay people. Hmm. So that's where we are now. Mm -hmm. And I think Machen helps us understand how we got here. As the church has come to grips with the cultural acceptance of the West and codification of gay marriage and identity politics, some have suggested that there doesn't need to be a choice between being gay or straight in the Church of Christ, that we can embrace Christians using LGBTQ nomenclature and live in a lifestyle that self-identifies as gay so long as they remain celibate. I asked Rosaria about this movement and if there were biblical grounds for this idea. Yeah, these are definitely two competing religions and it's really hard to, especially with the, the LGBTQ plus issue and community with side A and side B, you really, it's one thing to read Romans 1 and be able to, show that to side A. When you turn to side B, they're reading Romans 1 and they understand it from their no, perspective. From their perspective. And, well, they're, and they're reading it and they're saying, well, we're celibate right. and we're not practicing. Yeah. And, and yet, like you said, there's this waiting room yeah. which has always been disconcerting yeah. because you have people who are sometimes making covenants with one another and living in the same quarters with one another, or you're living in the same household with another couple, but there's a male, Th that seems like a recipe for disaster. And I don't know if there's statistics out there about how much of a waiting room it has been in the past, say, 10 years. Um, well, but that'd be interesting. actually, there is. Um, and uh, Josh Gilo from Truth Exchange was at the last Revoice conference. And one of the prayer sessions was a session where people confessed all of the all of the sexual sins. And if you look up um, um, a woman named oy, 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 uh, Bridget Eileen Rivera, uh, she has a blog called The Traveling Nun. In 2017, she said celibacy is impossible. And so the going, the going wisdom at Revoice now is celibacy is impossible. God loves us, but we should repent when we fail. Mm. And, and what I would say, and I'm quoting now a um, really excellent article up at Ref 21 by Andrew Branch and talking about um, uh, if you did, you know, can you deny the resurrection and believe Jesus is alive? And what he says is um, the, the celibate uh, gay Christian movement did by in its denial of progressive sanctification is actually denying the power of the resurrection. Mm -hmm. And so that's not a, you know, I, you know, we're not, we're reformed Presbyterians, so we're not Baptists. So we're not using those tiers, but when the Baptist talks about, you know, tier one, tier two, I right. just use the regular principle of worship. So if it's, <laughs> if it ain't going to happen, it ain't going to happen. But, but um, this is hardly a secondary problem. If you deny a, a, a primary doctrine of the Christian faith, you are showing yourself to be, uh, you know, an advocate of a religion that isn't Christianity. And, you know, for the last, well, since really the Revoice started in 2018, I have been saying things like, I don't share a religion with Greg Johnson. I don't share a religion with Nate Collins. I don't share a religion uh, with Wes Hill. And they don't like that, of course. And um, and they often, I mean, uh, well, Greg articulates it more, you know, completely, um, you know, uh, you know, when my spiritual siblings say that we don't share a religion, that is a form of spiritual abuse. Well, in some ways, I would rather be have him accuse me of spiritual abuse than I would have him accuse me of being his spiritual sibling, mm -hmm. because at least I can take on the abuse conversation. But when you start calling me your spiritual sibling, no wonder we're confusing people. Mm -hmm. Now, will he never be? I, I pray for him every day. Why not? I mean, I don't. But we are. These are different religions. These are different religions. And as, you know, Machen says at the end of this 
you know, this, this glorious chapter, not even, you know, if you're, if, 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 um, side B gay Christianity is righteous in its gayness, it's just not supposed to act on it. You know, Machen has key words. Um, um, not even Jesus called the righteous to repentance. So what do we think, what do we think we're going to do? Um, so anyway, I, I really think it helps to say things clearly. When we first talked to Rosera about the new edition of Christianity and Liberalism, she called it a sword to slay the LGBTQ idolatry of our day. I asked her about what she meant by that. Let's listen in. You've also described Machen's Christianity and liberalism as a sword to slay the LGBTQ idolatry of our day. Mm -hmm. Why do you call it idolatry? And how does Machen's book slay it? Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know it's idolatry when um, you are told if you don't bend the knee to it, you are committing genocide. So that's, I mean, I'm just, I'm just pulling a quote from things people have told me this week, right? <laughs> if I don't, if I, if I, you know, you know, cause if you think two plus two is four, obviously you're just like a fundamentalist, racist, you know, homophobe, I, I, you know, obviously. Um, so, you know, it's idolatry when affirmation is a prerequisite for a relationship. When I met Ken Smith, you know, a quarter century ago, he could say to me, Rosaria, I accept you as a lesbian, but I don't approve of you. And I wasn't the least bit offended. Why? Because why would I expect the Bible believing evangelical Christian to approve? Of it? You know, I knew enough of the Bible to know that that would be stupid. But now the, you know, the dignitary harm clause says you must approve. You can't possibly separate those two things. You're going to wound someone's dignity and wounding someone's dignity is equivalent to breaking their legs. Well, again, that's crazy. And one of the things that that Machen does so powerfully is he shows that this is a competing religion. This is and that's where people like David French are literally out of their minds. This is not a question of a kind of liberal pluralism at work. This isn't the marketplace of ideas. It is, and, and again, we know that because we are com we are compelled, we are required to bend the knee. You know, recently um, in my neighborhood, I you know some neighbors pulled me aside and said, Rosaria, we have this problem. You know, at the public pool, our, all of our kids are you know swimming and. There's this quote unquote transgender swimmer and, you know, and these are a bunch of Christians who just like, what do you think we should do? And um, it was really fascinating, too, because in this group of Christians, you had uh, confessional reformed Christians, you had reformed Baptists, and then you had this kind of mega church. I don't even know what you want to call it, just this kind of squishy nonsense and sure enough, you know, I I gave people a little, you know, a little summary of where we are, right? You'd have to kind of build a map for people and put the little red dot and say, now look, you know, why is Christianity so divided on this? This is not divisive. Well, there are three reasons. Because Christ is not divided. Um, we've 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 failed to see that the seeds of the gospel are in the garden. Um, we have just, you know, failed. Uh, to read the times, the three exchanges of Romans one have been codified in a Burgefell and Bostag. And we have failed to distinguish between friends and enemies. We don't want to love our enemies. We want to make believe that our enemies are our friends. You can't be a soft presence anymore in the world. If you try to be a soft presence in the world, what you will end up at best is being righteous lot. So, you know, and then and then everybody's like, but aren't we supposed to be Christians in the world, but not of the world? Yes. Are you strong enough? Because if you're strong enough, then you're going to go have an intervention. See, to be a Christian in the world right now means you get up every morning and you say, Lord, uh, 
May all the people I offend today be offended to your glory. And if I lose my job, please protect my family. So that's what it means to be in the world. Are you up for that? And sure enough, what we saw were the the real Christians were like, yeah, okay, we're going to have an intervention. We're going to go to the school board meeting. We're going to go to the meeting and we're going to say, let's use the definition of biological sex that we've used for thousands of years. And sure enough, you know, you had the the ladies from the mega church, sort of, you know, rich young ruler style, being deeply offended that they might be denied their five-year-old's favorite enrichment activity for the summer. Like somehow that was asking too much of them. That's appalling. That's appalling. And so one of the things that Machen does so helpfully, because this is an idol, it's an idol. We, you know, five years ago, reasonable people would not have thought it was a good idea to have biological men swimming in women's teams and and disrobing in the locker room. I, you know, it just wasn't, it wouldn't even, you would have, it would have been laughed out loud if you said that or just a rebuked soundly. Uh, but it's an idol because we have been told again and again to bend the knee. And again and again, we just keep making these soft concessions. And Machen comes out, writes this book, and maybe even, you know, in addition, not only was it powerful that he wrote this amazing book, but what happened to Machen? Oh, he got excommunicated. He suffered for the truth. And that is a model for us. And that is our secret weapon. Um, you cannot uh, make peace with idols in the same way that you cannot turn, um, you know, enmity must be mortified. Sin must be mortified. And so, again, I mean, I think that, the, you know, what Machen calls low visibility and what your local megachurch calls nuance or ambiguity or everything's gray I think you just get to call it out. Hmm. And, you know, here's the thing about being a Christian and especially being a public Christian in the world. If you're wrong, you repent and you do it publicly. It turns out that Christianity and liberalism actually has quite a lot to say about our modern predicaments, even when it comes to recent trends like transgenderism. Here's Machen. True religion can make no peace with a false philosophy, any more than with a science that is falsely so-called. A thing cannot possibly be true in religion and false in philosophy or in science. You know, this relates to another lie that you mentioned confronts uh, transgenderism is normal. Yeah. So yeah. in the yeah. third chapter of Christianity and Liberalism, Machen says, quote, True religion can make no peace with a false philosophy any more than with a science that is falsely so-called. A thing right. cannot possibly be true in religion and false in philosophy or in science. All methods of arriving at truth, if they be valid methods, will arrive at a harmonious result, end quote. Right. So obviously we're at a crossroads with right. gender today. People right. cite science to tell us a boy can be a girl, a girl can be a boy, or right. as you mentioned in your book, a 52-year-old 50, a husband and father of seven can be a transgender six-year-old girl named Stephanie, if he mm -hmm. wants to be. Mm -hmm. But the Christian religion claims that God made you who you are at birth. Mm -hmm. How should Christians resolve that tension? Yeah, yeah. Well, and I don't think we, I mean, I, I think we defy that tension. I don't think we mm. resolve it. I'm not, I don't, I don't, you can't make peace with this. You just have to like, this is where like the homeschool grandma just comes in here. You just have to nail it. But I don't know. You probably all know this book. It's an awesome book. Chris Gordon's book, um, The New Reformation Catechism on Human Sexuality. I mean, I think he says it best here in, um, in his question number six, question number six is, but aren't we able to make a distinction between biological sex and gender in search of our identity. And he says, no, God established a natural order in the creation of male and female that is good for us as image bearers of God. To introduce gender as a new category of personhood 
separate from the biological category of sex in pursuit of a different sexual identity is unnatural to the creation order and harmful to the purpose for which God made us. So we don't resolve anything. We just stand on the word of God and we say that's nonsense. And what transgenderism is, is important. Um, transgenderism is the sin of envy. And so how do you resolve sin? Well, you don't resolve sin. You mortify sin. And envy is rottenness to the bones. And um, to pretend that transgenderism is not the sin of envy, to pretend that it's, um, you know, it's just a, a normal gender diversity um, is, is really to just encourage people to violate the 10th commandment. You are not to covet your neighbor's uh, wife and you are not to covet your neighbor's sexual anatomy. Um, and, and, you know, but what, and you might say, but what about those cases? What about those cases where, you know, you know, there's something not right. Um, and, and, you know, and, and you have a child who has experiencing, uh, painful, um, discordance between their body and their mind and how God made them. And, you know, even the very ideologically motivated and liberal APA would say in 85% of the time, those normal puberty will resolve that. And what you would do between six and puberty is obviously provide appropriate biblical counseling and lots of love and lots of support. And, you know, you're going to rip that. You're not even going to think about government schools. You're not, you know, you're not, you know, I mean, any of that, you're going to, you're going to be a responsible Christian parent. Um, but, um, um, you know, I, it just, it, it, it is, it, it we cannot, uh, we, we see how ideologically driven this is. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and that's part of why the pronoun issue is such a big issue. I mean, it, it's, um, we're not just talking about terminology, we're talking about ideology. And so Christians, um, especially I would say broad evangelicals, are just, you know, they're just, they, they commit category mistake after category mistake after category mistake. And Machen is so helpful in forcing us to not do that and to see the danger when we do. You know, Christians can be dangerous in the world when they baptize with Christ's approval what Christ himself defies. Yeah, and that's the thing with methods and theories. They're undergirded with a secular ideology, and Christians do try to baptize them and use them uh, in very unhelpful ways. And some of them don't even know the ideology. Like some some people don't even know what the term intersectionality means. Right. Can Can you define intersectionality and briefly talk about how this is misled Christians? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So intersectionality is a, um, at, at best, it is an analytical tool that's uh, emerged in uh, the social sciences and, and the humanities in universities about 20 years ago, basically makes the case that the more levels of oppression you experience in the world, the more compromised your ability to speak and to and to have a voice in the world and and of course it's a very secular it's it, it, it's an inherently entirely secular worldview so your personhood your life your everything depends upon you having a voice in the world now very opposite to what the the, the, the gospel says right your value in Christ is that you have been saved by his blood, that you have been adopted, you have been justified, you have been sanctified, you will be glorified, and that you belong. But in a secular world, it's never about belonging. It's about empowering. It's about mm -hmm. having a voice. And so obviously uh, a transgendered, incarcerated uh, you know, man who identifies as a cat has many more, you know, needs for voice. And it's so interesting to me, the whole uh, side B gay Christian movements, 
you know, great Mardi Gras experience. It's called Revoice. And the reason is because, of course, because it's a secular organization that wants to be, you know, baptize some things with a Christian veneer. It needs a voice. That's what you need. If you're a gay Christian, you need a voice. No, you need sanctification. You need progressive sanctification so that you no longer have to be gay. What you get in Christ is the ability to to know that your sins do not reign in you, even as you struggle with them. So um, so that's what intersectionality is. And so it's especially, uh, it, you know, it, it, it you, you can see the way it has affected even Christians when um, you're watching podcasts of young evangelical pastors and they're painting their fingernails and they're they're speaking with a little bit of a gay lisp and they're, I mean, you know, I don't know. I can see this stuff coming. I haven't been lobotomized yet. Um, and it's not, you know, it's not men and women are not interchangeable. Men are to be leaders. They are to be strong. They are to be protective of their flock and their family. That is good. We need that. Again, like in Machen's day, it seems like there are modern concepts and categories and trends that the church is unprepared to deal with. Even as many make courageous stands against LGBTQ ideology in the church, others have fallen prey to the promise of fulfillment that that worldview offers. I asked Rosera how the church can maintain its hope, even as it seems like we're losing a high stakes culture war. And let me just say something else about that, because there may be people listening who have really fallen into the transgender trap. There may be young women who are listening who have taken enough testosterone so that their voices are permanently changed and they have permanent facial hair and they are indeed infertile. And there may be some other really difficult consequences. We may have listeners who have gone through what they call gender affirming um, surgery and have mutilated their bodies. And they may be very discouraged listening to me. And I don't want you to be discouraged listening to me because in some ways the gospel is the best news for people who have fallen under the false uh, identity of transgenderism, because in the new Jerusalem, you are going to be made perfectly well. And there is no genital mutilation um, there is there is no regret in heaven, and there is no bodily dysfunction, um, either from self or from other harm, in the New Jerusalem. In Christ, there are no regrets. Hmm. That's great hope, especially when you think about the gospel establishing our worth in Christ, apart from anything externally speaking. Uh, that is the great hope of the gospel that's held out to all people. A very special thanks to our guest, Rosera Butterfield, for joining us on this episode of Christianity and Liberalism. Join us next time for part two of my conversation with Rosaria on God and Man. This episode of Christianity and Liberalism was brought to you by Westminster Seminary Press. Westminster Seminary Press has published a brand new edition of the book this show is based on, Christianity and Liberalism by J. Gressa Machen. This 100th anniversary edition features a new forward by Kevin DeYoung and is available to order now at wtsbooks.com. Listeners to this podcast can get a free download of the Christianity and Liberalism audiobook at checkout when you enter the promo code MACHEN23. That's M-A-C-H-E-N 23. This podcast was based on the book Christianity and Liberalism by J. Gressa Machen and hosted by David Brionis. This episode was produced by Josh Curry and Jimmy Atkins. Audio captured by Paul Quorum, edited and engineered by Will Bowblitz. Our theme song was written by Timothy Brindle and produced by Nobody Special. Thanks for listening.
Nature wrote Christianity and liberalism To demonstrate they're two completely different religions Liberalism denies man's wicked condition And divine inspiration with which scripture was written Us Christians are convinced scripture's truly factual But liberalism denies the supernatural Matron's book definitely showed Christianity and liberalism are diametrically opposed It's not a different version of Christianity It has opposite views of God and humanity Often disguised with Christian terminology they baptize the serpents, absurd philosophy. So when we call you a liberal, it's not just political But rejecting his virgin birth and all of his miracles From trusting in science But against God, it's disgusting to find yourself Is your trust and reliance? The line is drawn in the sand Christ is God and he's man Upon the rock of the word of God we will stand We bring the antithesis The lamb's dripping wrist Is still the only answer for man's wickedness The line is drawn in the sand Christ is God and he's man Upon the rock of the word of God we will stand CNL with Machen we will tell Faith in Christ still the only way to be redeemed from hell Machen press men to be honest Don't call it Christian if it essentially is godless Christianity's based on events God accomplished Christ was sent to bring redemption he promised yeah. Not just an ethical leader, respectable teacher But God in the flesh, yes our blessed redeemer An affront to human pride You can only be saved by faith in Christ who was crucified Amen. Our greatest needs to be redeemed by the Son It's not what we're Jesus do but what Jesus has done since we're slaves to doubt pride and lust we're in desperate need of rescue that's outside of us an understatement to say that we're flawed in need of what Machen called a creative act of God cuz we're torn by sin we've been abhorring him not just sick but dead we must be born again God's enemies his arrogant opponents who can only be saved by vicarious atonement judgment fell on Christ in my place unrighteous guilty sinners are only righteous by grace scriptures historical acts they are certain Jesus the God man the supernatural person we need new hearts he's the compassionate surgeon by his death and resurrection he's smashing the serpent the line is drawn in the sand Christ is God and he's man upon the rock of the word of God we will stand we bring the antithesis the lamb's dripping wrist is still the only answer for man's wickedness the line is drawn in the sand Christ is God and he's man upon the rock of the word of God we will stand CNL with Machen we will tell faith in Christ still the only way to be redeemed from my hell. intention is to show and I'll mention in this flow Machen's words are as useful as a century ago uh -huh. Liberalism breeds destruction, it's hopeless Today it's deconstruction and wokeness Rooted in paganism, atheism Like Satan's mission to make CRT state religion These abominations we see to this day In denominations like the PC USA Why embrace Machen's great wisdom In light of the claims of his racism In 1913 Machen wrote mom complaining Angry about Princeton's campus integration I can't believe the decision of Warfield But this cancer of heart, I'm sure the Lord healed See, Warfield became Machen's mentor An instrument for Machen to repent more Showing his need of the Savior to change him But consider the Lord's grace of sanctification Machen became friends with an African-American named Charlie Machen Gladly had cherished him As a matter of fact, Charlie had a cataract Skin color didn't matter as Machen had his back Paid for the operation, stay with him in the hospital Christ changing Machen, not an impossible obstacle Amen. From his love for his friend Charlie It's quite clear Christ was changing Machen partly Any bigotry left, it's not there any longer Perfected now in the presence of his father The line is drawn in the sand Christ is God and he's man Upon the rock of the word of God we will stand We bring the antithesis The lamb's dripping wrist is still the only answer for man's wickedness The line is drawn in the sand Christ is God and he's man Upon the rock of the word of God we will stand CNL with Machen we will tell Faith in Christ still the only way to be redeemed from hell